Well, Johnny Depp's lawyers are responding to Amber Heard's request to overturn the defamation verdict. Depp's legal team urged a Virginia judge to leave the judgment intact. His team filed the papers yesterday, and then they disputed the arguments from Heard's team that the jury's verdict was nonsensical and unfounded. They also called the details about jurors uh, number 15's identity irrelevant and claimed that it is too late for Amber Heard's team to object now after the verdict. This juror number 15 has been the center of a lot of discussion. Court papers revealed that a court summons went out to a 77-year-old, but the man who showed up was his 52-year-old son. They share the same name, live at the same address, and he was seated on the jury. Amber Heard's team says uh, that's enough for a new trial. Depp and Heard are now waiting for the judge to weigh in. We'll um, have to wait and see what she does, but we should check in with trial attorney Michelle Thomas in Silver Spring, Maryland, and criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Marie Pereira in New York. Michelle, you're there uh, in that jurisdiction. You've practiced in that courthouse. What happened with Juror 15? <laughs> I, I don't know how that, if, if that's true, how that may have occurred or how that happened, but I do think there's validity to the Deb team's argument that they waived the right to challenge it when they went through the entire voir dire process. Uh, they didn't raise any challenges at that time or objections to any uh, inconsistencies between the biographical data and the juror uh, himself. And so I think that they're really grasping at straws to say that that should be a basis for a new trial in this case. And I think it's it's a stretch in Fairfax. Uh, Marie, what if, if, if the son sees dad's summons and says, ooh, it's the Depp trial. I'm going, not you, dad, you stay here in your rocker. I'm going to the courthouse. What, with, if, if that is established, that changes it, does it, doesn't it? Or no? Thing. I've never heard of something like this happening, but let me play devil's advocate for um, against what Michelle is saying a little bit. I don't know if it's irrelevant. I'm not sure if they knew about it and just sat on it. In that case, yeah, maybe you waived it if you knew it was happening and you knew it wasn't the right juror in the box and you just saved it so that you could come up with something on appeal. But if they didn't know, I think it could be something that's really appealable because the age of someone determines their state of mind and their the way they look at life and the way they could rule on a verdict. So we're talking about 52 and maybe even 72. I think there could be some grounds for appeal if they really didn't know and the court was unaware. During voir dire, it wasn't discovered. I think it could be some small ground for appeal. But Marie, uh, to push back a little bit, what, who, why does it matter? The person that shows up shows up, and if you're, you've got the stats in front of you, and, and, and the person's supposed to be 77, and they're, and you look at them, they're like, wow, that guy looks pretty good for 77, and no one asks them about it, then they get, as Michelle said, they got through the voir dire process and they said, yeah, let's get him on the panel. Why does that matter? But sometimes during voir dire, you take into account everything about a proposed juror, their age, their life experience, and then you put that all together and match it up with your situation to see who would be the better juror to come up with the outcome that you're looking for. And age to me matters. And if I'm picking someone who I think is 52, um, and the person uh, who I think is 72 and the person's mind frame is actually 52 because that person is 52. It makes a difference in the outcome. Um, I think it does matter. If they didn't know, it could be something that they can raise on appeal. Michelle, your thoughts. Uh, they have the benefit that we don't have, which is the visual. They got to see the actual jurors. And I believe there was a 25 year age gap 
uh, between the two uh, uh, possible prospective jurors. And they had an opportunity to challenge that, to your point, Ted. They had an opportunity to say, well, wait a minute, you know, is this person actually 77? They chose not to do that. And I don't believe that, I didn't say that it was not relevant, but I don't think that it's going to be a basis for a new trial in the circuit court. Does Amber Heard's team have to do everything they can to try to overturn uh, the outcome here? Of course they do, but is it, a, is it viable? Probably not, I think it's a stretch. Our Chanley Painter interviewed Ben Chu after the verdict came in, and he talked about the fact that uh, Amber Heard's team, well, of course they're upset. They lost. Take a listen. I want to talk about uh, Heard's lead attorney, Elaine Bredhoff. She claims that your team demonized uh, Amber Heard and suppressed evidence. What's your response? I think it's disappointing that she would say something like that with respect to suppression of evidence there was a lot more evidence that came in in fairfax county than ever came in in london and i i took that uh as not being complimentary of our judge who was a wonderful judge i i don't think i just think that's an improper characterization as far as demonization the cross-examination of Ms. Heard that was done, I believe, beautifully by Camille Vasquez was not intended to demonize her. It really was predicated on her own words. So the cross-examination was based on statements that Ms. Heard had made and presenting her with some audios that she herself had made and really asking for her explanation. I don't think that's demonization. I think that's cross-examination. As Ben Chu talking with our Chandler Peter Marie, if uh, let's say that Judge Azkaradi says, oh, okay, I'm throwing this out, new trial, Johnny Depp's not going to go do this again. I mean, as much as maybe some of us would want him to, and we go through this whole exercise again, he's already won, right? He's, he's got his life back. He's out touring with Jeff Beck, writing songs. Uh, and and, um, and living the life that he was trying to get to had he not been labeled this wife beater. Your thoughts on, on the fact that no matter what happens here, do you think there would ever be a redo of this case if indeed um, at some point this gets thrown out? I don't think there'd be a redo. I think, like you said, he's won in the court of public opinion. He's won in the court of real court. And there's nothing else that he needs to defend. He will move on with his life and, and not do this again. If anything, I think it'll put her in a worse position in the court of public opinion if this thing is ever thrown out. And I do agree with Michelle. I don't think that there's enough here for the judge to say, we're throwing this out, let's do a new trial. Maybe there's reason to... Um, admonish whoever uh, collects the information and maybe change things to, to make sure that something like this doesn't happen. But I don't think there's enough here for, for uh, this to be like thrown out at all. Is there enough, Michelle, for the judge or judge um, Escarati to bring in this juror, juror 15, and say, hey, what was your motivation here? Was this a mistaken identity or were you trying to pull one over? You know, that's a really good question, Ted. I, yeah. I think to my colleague's point, it may the focus may first be on sort of the, the clerk's offices and the persons that are responsible for uh, the jury pool to find out what happened, investigating there, doing sort of an internal investigation. Um, whether they bring in the juror to find out whether he had ill motives, you know, that remains to be seen. This is a unique situation. This is not something that we see often. Uh, but to the extent that the court is not is going to deny the motion for a new trial, they they may not go down that path. But that that's a good point and good question.